the origins of Islamic Irfan. In order to understand any discipline or science, it is essential to study its history and the historical developments associated with it. One must also be acquainted with the personalities who have originated or inherited it and with its source books. In this lecture and the fourth one, we will turn to these matters. The first issue to arise is whether Islamic Irfan is a discipline that originated in the Islamic tradition, such as Fiqh, Usul al-Fiqh, Tafsir, and Ilm al-Hadi. This is, is it one of those disciplines that were originated by the Muslims who, having received in Islam the original inspiration, sources, and raw materials, developed them by discovering their rules and principles? Or is it one of those sciences that found their way into the Islamic world from outside like medicine and mathematics, which were then developed further by the Muslims in the environment of Islamic civilization and culture? Or is there a third possibility? The Orafa themselves maintain the first of these alternatives and are in no way ready to admit any other. Some Orientalists, however, have insisted, and some still insist, on the second view that Ilfan and its subtle and sublime ideas have come into the Islamic world from outside. Sometimes they maintain a Christian origin for it and claim that mysticism and Islam is the result of early contact of the Muslim with the Christian monks. At other times, they claim it to be a result of the Persians' reaction against Islam and the Arabs. Then again, sometimes they make it entirely a product of Neoplatonism, which itself was composed of the ideas of Plato, Aristotle, and Pythagoras, influenced by Alexandrian Gnosticism and the views and beliefs of Judaism and Christianity. Sometimes they claim it to be derived from Buddhism. Similarly, the opponents of Irfan in the Islamic world also strive to show the whole of Irfan and Sufism as being alien to Islam. And for this purpose, they too maintain that Masses has non-Islamic origins. A third view admits that Irfan, whether practical or theoretical, draws its primary inspiration and material from Islam itself. Having taken these material, it has tried to give it a structure by devising certain rules and principles and in this process has also been influenced by external currents, especially the ideas of scholasticism and philosophy, especially of the illuminationist school. Now, there are a number of questions which arise in this context. Firstly, to what extent have the Orafa been successful in developing correct rules and principles for structuring their material? Have the Orafa been as successful in carrying this out as the jurisprudence? To what extent have the Orafa felt themselves bound not to deviate from the actual principles of Islam? And similarly, to what extent has Irfan been influenced by the ideas of outside traditions? Has Irfan assimilated these external ideas by shaping them in its particular molds and used them in its development, or contrarily, have the waves of these foreign currents carried away Irfan in their flow? Each of these questions requires a separate study and careful research. But that which is certain is that Irfan has derived its basic sources of inspiration from Islam itself and from nowhere else. Let us consider this point. 
Those who accept the first view, and to some extent also those who take the second view, see Islam as being a simple religion, popular and unsophisticated, free of all sorts of mysteries and difficult or unintelligible profoundities. To them, the doctrinal system of Islam rests on Tawheed, monotheism, which means that just as a house has a builder other than itself, so the world has a transient creator other than itself. Also, the basis of man's relationship with the enjoyments of this world is, in this view, zuhd, abstinence. In their definition of zuhd, it means refraining from the ephemeral pleasures of this world in order to attain the everlasting enjoyments of the hereafter. Besides these, there are a series of simple and practical rituals and laws that are handled by speech. Therefore, in this group's view, that which the Orifa call Tawheed is an idea that goes beyond the simple monotheism of Islam. For the Arif's view of Tawheed is existentialist monism, and in the sense that he believes that nothing exists except God, his names, attributes, and manifestations. Similarly, the Arif's concept of the Tariqa goes beyond the Sharia of Islam, for the practice of the Tariqa involves matters unknown to fiqh. Furthermore, in the view of this group, the pious among the Holy Prophet's companions whom the Orifa claimed to be their precursors were no more than pious men. Their souls knew nothing of the spiritual path of Irfan and its Tawhid. They were simple otherworldly people who abstained from worldly pleasures and directed their attention to the hereafter, and whose souls were dominated by mixed feelings of fear and hope, fear of punishment of hell and hope of rewards of paradise. That is all. In reality, this view can in no way be endorsed. The primal sources of Islam are far more extensively richer than what this group, out of ignorance and or knowingly, supposes. Neither the Islamic concept of Tawheed is as simple and empty as they suppose, nor Islam limits man's spirituality to a dry piety, nor were the pious companions of the Holy Prophet simple ascetics. Nor is the simple code of conduct confined to the actions of bodily limbs and organs. In this lecture, brief evidence will be produced that will suffice to show that Islam's fundamental teachings are capable of having inspired a chain of profound spiritual ideas both in the theoretical and practical realms of Yerfan. However, the question of the extent to which the Islamic mystics have used and benefited from Islam's fundamental teachings and the extent to which they may have deviated is one that we cannot go into these short lectures. On the subject of Tawheed, the Holy Quran never likens God and the creation to a builder and a house. The Qur'an identifies God as the creator of the world, stating at the same time that his holy essence is everywhere and with everything. Whither, so ever you turn, there is the face of God. Chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, verse 115. And we are nearer to him than the jugular wing. Chapter 50. Chapter Kaf. Verse 16. He is the first and the last, the outward and the inward. Chapter 57. Chapter Hadid. Verse 16. Evidently, these kinds of forces represent a call to the thinking minds of, to a conception of Tawheed which goes beyond commonplace monotheism, 
a tradition of all coffee states that God revealed the opening verses of the Surah al-Hadid and Surah al-Ikhlas, because he knew that in future generations there will emerge people who will think profoundly about Tawheed. As to the spiritual path of Irfan, in which a series of stages leading to ultimate nearness to God are conceived, it suffices to take into account the Quranic verses which mention such notions as Lika Allah, meaning with God, Ridwan Allah, God's good pleasure, or those which relate to revelation, Wahi, Ilham, inspiration, and the angels speaking to others who are not prophets, for instance, Mary, and especially the verses relating to the holy prophet's ascension, Miraj. Chapter 17, verse 1. In the Quran, there is mention of the commanding self, Al-Nafs Al-Amara, chapter 12, verse 53. The self-accusative self, Al-Nafs al Lawama, chapter 75, verse 2. And the contented self, Al-Nafs al mutmainah chapter 89, verse 27. There is mention of acquired knowledge, al-ilm al-ifadi, and inspired knowledge, al-ilm al-adunni, chapter 18, verse 65, and of forms of guidance resulting from spiritual struggle. And those who struggle in us, we will surely guide them to our paths. Chapter 29, verse 69. Mention is made in the Quran of the purification of the self and is counted as one of the things leading to salvation and deliverance. By the self, verily he who purifies it has succeeded, while he who corrupts it has indeed failed. Chapter 91. Verse 7 to 10. There is also repeated mention there of love of God as a passion above all other human loves and attractions. The Quran also speaks about all the particles of creation glorifying and praising God. Chapter 17, verse 44. And this is phrased in a way to imply that if one were to perfect his understanding, he would be able to perceive their praise and magnification of God. Moreover, the Quran raises the issue of the divine breath in relation to the nature and constitution of the human being. Chapter 32, verse 9. This and much more besides is sufficient to have inspired a comprehensive and magnificent spirituality regarding God, the world, and man, particularly regarding his relationship with God. As previously mentioned, we are not considering how the Muslim Orafa have made use of these resources, or whether their utilization has been correct or incorrect. We are understanding whether there did exist such great resources that could have provided efficient inspiration uh, for Irfan in the Islamic world, even if we suppose that those usually classed as Urafa could not make proper use of them, others who are not classified as such did make use of them. In addition to the Quran, the traditions, sermons, supplications, dua, polemical dialogues, ihtijad, in addition to the Qur'an, the traditions, sermons, supplications, polemical dialogues, jajat, and the biographies of the great figures of Islam, all show that the spiritual life current in the early days of Islam was not merely a lifeless type of asceticism blended with a worship performed in the hope of the rewards of paradise. Concepts and notions are found in the traditions, sermons, supplications, and 
polemical dialogues that stand at a very high level of sublimity. Similarly, the biographies of the leading personalities of the early days of Islam display many instances of spiritual ecstasy. Visions, occurrences, inner insights, and burning spiritual love. We will now relate an example to it. Al Kafi relates that one morning after performing the dawn prayer, a young man, Haritha ibn Malik ibn Nu'man al Ansari, caught the Prophet's eye. Lean and pale, his eyes sunken, he gave the impression of being unaware of his own condition and of being unable to keep his balance. How are you? inquired the Prophet. I have attained a certain faith, the youth replied. What is the sign of your certainty? the Prophet asked. The youth replied that his certainty had immersed him in grief. It kept him awake all night in worship and thirsty by day in fasting and had separated him from the world and its matters so completely that it seemed to him as if he could see the divine throne already set up on the judgment day to settle the people's accounts. That he together with all of mankind were raised from the dead. He said that it seemed to him that even at that moment he could see the people of paradise enjoying its bounties and the people of hell suffering torments and he could hear the roar of its flames. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, turned to his companions and told them, This is a man whose heart has been illuminated with the light of faith by God. Then he said to the youth, Preserve this condition you are in, and do not let it be taken away from you. Pray for me. The youth replied, that God may grant me martyrdom. Not long after this encounter, a battle took place, and the youth taking part was granted his wish and his was martyred. The life, utterances, and prayers of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, are rich with spiritual enthusiasm and ecstasy and full of indications of Gnosis and the Orapha often rely on the Prophet's supplications as reference and evidence for their views.